So, uh, thank you for coming to our talk instead of Tom Dale's. It's going to um, be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we also have seven talks to give instead of just one. We noticed a lot of really cool stuff happening in JavaScript and the magic internet land lately, and really couldn't figure out just one thing to talk about. So we copped out, and we're going to talk about seven. Yeah, so like if you get bored, just wait like five minutes. So first, we're going to talk about education. Uh, so I'm Nick. I wanted to find a picture for us to all get to know each other a little better. That's really gross. Uh, and I was at the dentist recently. So these are my teeth. Um, my, <laughs> my name is Edward. Uh, apparently, this is me. I swear this is not Photoshopped. The other guy is another guy I teach with. Uh, so we both work at Shopify, which is a really cool e-commerce and JS and Rails company. Right, and uh, we decided that we wanted to do more teaching. Uh, I've had a big, back, big, a big background in like Rails development, Ruby stuff, then I did some developer advocacy, and then I went to Toby, the Shopify CEO, and I was like, hey, I would really love to do more teaching. And he's like, no problem. Uh, we just st uh, struck a deal with these guys called HackerU, and they're like uh, a beginning hacker school, and uh, we got to use our lounge to teach the school in. So this is about like 30-something students, uh, not all of them here. Um, but this is a picture of Shopify's lounge. The students came from across the world. It was awesome. In order to do this thing, I needed a co-pilot. So I like looped Nick into this. I was kind of voluntold that I would be teaching JavaScript. And I kind of thought that it would be like oh, yeah. a one-day JavaScript course. It was not. It no, was surprise. a full-time, nine-week nine course where we just like info-dumped everything we know about full-stack web development into these students. I did not find this out until about three weeks into the program. But it was fantastic. Um, we decided to take a different approach than a lot of other boot camps. Uh, we wanted to, uh, instead of like being a super pressured, stress environment, uh, it was learn at your own pace. Uh, you've got nine weeks. And what's also cool about this scenario is that this room is full of like professional Shopify developers during the day, and designers, and other people who work at Shopify. So it meant that if you were interested, you could hang out and like talk to people about what their lives are like, you know, like things beyond just the technical portion. This really worked out for us. Yeah, it was an awesome program, uh, and we learned a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, so the first thing we learned, or the first thing we want to say, is if you're thinking about teaching anything, or even if you're not, you just, just do, do it, it anyway. It's amazing. Like, uh, everybody ends up learning something from it. Uh, it's not just the students, it's the people around the students, it's the teachers, and the people who are connected to the students' lives. It's awesome. Next slide. Um, right. We also discovered that the teachable moments happen in those environments where you let them happen. Just like talking to somebody about how to do something is not such a great way to teach. It's really like, I'm going to prepare a space and a time and a comfortable place for you to like, figure out which questions you need to ask me and which questions you need to ask yourself in order to like, index and unlock some stuff in your own head. Basically, we started off the class by basically giving the students a textbook and saying, here, let's go through this together and ask us questions when oh, you yeah. have them. I was like, I learned from a textbook. This is the best way. And then like 75% of the students were like, this is shit. It did work for 25% of the students, though. Yeah. But that's like the important lesson, is that everybody learns differently. And what works for one student won't work for four other students. Right. And like the whole, like, some people learn visually, some people learn orally, whatever. Uh, also, not really the case. People switch m modes like Every throughout day. the same day. Yeah. So we had some students who were like, I don't understand anything. But the moment you sit down with them and you like draw a picture for them about like this is what happens when a request comes in and it goes through the stack, you like see lights turning on and it's the best possible feeling you can have. So whatever interaction may be, whether it's sitting down with them, answering questions, drawing pictures, uh, or building apps together, like that's when students are going to learn the best. Right. So we decided to like not just do full lectures. This was something that we figured out later on. We lectured for like five, 10 minutes, then we stopped class, and then we held little workshops for like 15 minutes. So uh, again, like if you were bored, you just had to wait 10 minutes and then you'd get something totally different. And during these workshops, it's not just like one person working by themselves. We really encourage them to pair program and talk to each other and get better at like the non-technical stuff. Like how do you give feedback? How do you take feedback? How do you work together on a team? 
Exactly. That kind of stuff. So while awesome. they were working on their own, uh, basically that, gave, uh, that freed us up to be able to walk around, answer questions, help students out with whatever they needed. But the problem that we ended up having was uh, our time was being too uh, monopolized by single questions. Uh, yeah, and there's only two of us asking and answering questions from like 30 people. So instead of one of our students decided to make a solution to this problem, like this was his first Rails app, awesome. He like, learned how to build this in class, saw a problem in class that it was too hard to uh, get questions answered. So he built Hacker Q. Get it? Like Hacker like, U, hacker but with a Q? Rhymes. So like, OK, yeah. Right. So um, what was amazing about this was this was not something that we asked for. This is a student who was like, this is a problem in my own life. I'm going to use the things that you just taught me to build out a better solution. Super cool. This is what you want to have happen when you're a teacher. Uh, it's really nice. It uses WebSockets, so people can make, submit questions pseudo-anonymously. We see them immediately, can log in as instructors or mentors, answer the questions. Students can answer each other's questions. That reduced our workload as well. Um, but like, have, have any of you ever taught and done something like this? Like, Who here uh, has a problem with what we're doing right now? Is everybody comfortable? Is this OK? Everyone understands? It's the worst. It is so crappy. Like, Basically, you ask that question, do you guys understand? Are we good? Can we keep going? And all you see is, yeah, yeah. Like, How many times have you ever seen someone go like, yes, I do actually have a problem. Uh, could you stop the class for a moment and like, tell me more? Never, Never happens. Happened. Everyone is like either uncomfortable, they just say nothing, or they nod their head because they're like, I don't want to be that person that holds up the class. So um, I may um, have flipped out in one class and maybe called people some terrible liars. Uh, I don't feel good about it. But while I was apologizing to a large group of people, um, some of them took it to heart and decided to fix that problem with the stuff that we were teaching them. So they built this thing called curry. It has nothing to do with the fact that one of the team members is Indian. That stuff is delicious. So Curry is short for curriculum. And basically, what it allows uh, us as teachers to do is go through our curriculum and our topics for the day, put in different learning objectives and the different topics. And first of all, this really helps the students visualize and like get a mental yeah. model of everything that they're going to be learning. So we type this in. They can see it during the class. They've got an idea of where they are. And then whenever we're like, hey, uh, does anyone feel uncomfortable? Like, can we continue? Do you understand? Instead, we just ask them to go to this URL, and then they anonymously hit one of these things for where they are in the curriculum, and then we instantly get uh, feedback that looks like this. So, so this is another WebSockets app. Uh, it's a Node server and a Rails backend. And basically, as a teacher, we can see this analytics view. And every time a student submits feedback, we immediately get this bar, and we can gauge how well the students are doing. Do we need to slow down, speed up? Where do we need to spend more time reviewing? So this was super, super helpful yeah, for us. Yeah, we did not ask for this. Um, super cool. The students are actually taking this and turning it into a startup, like tears, falling, magic dreams. So. This is exactly what you want to happen. Yeah. Props uh, to our students. Props to Shopify for letting us teach the love of the web. All That's right. very sweet. OK, next talk. Thanks. Uh, um, Commerce.js. We're doing neat stuff with JavaScript at Shopify, which is incidentally a company that lets, lets you, you open up a store online. Exactly. So we want to talk about how JavaScript is helping our merchants uh, sell more wares and make more monies. So I'm Nick. Uh, these are my teeth. This is um, Edward. I look like this. Here, there's a tiger. Shopify. Uh, we work at Shopify. We just launched Shopify 2. So Shopify 2 is a gigantic single page application. It's our merchant editing interface. Uh, but basically, it's huge. It has like 100 different models, thousands of different views, and probably quadrillions of lines of code. I'm not exaggerating. Uh, no, it's definitely a huge app. And it's all built on top of Batman.js. Yo, demo. Too many words. We're behind time. OK, this is a quick demo. Uh, it looks like this. You can't see that. Oh, no. Oh, it looks like this. Yeah. There we go. Why is it so little? Anyway, it looks like this. Right, so this uh, is the, the like admin side. This is what uh, the merchant or the customer is looking at. And they can drive their store. Uh, what's awesome about this is that it's super fast. There's no page reloading. You know the drill. It's all push state. It's and all single page app. Like Shopify, the core side, is instantly getting a lot smaller. Like If you go, uh, push your stuff up on GitHub, they identify it uh, based on its language. So Shopify is now a JavaScript app, according to GitHub, because we've been taking so much out of the Rails side. And then 
producing this beautiful thing. Shopify is just a Rails API now. Uh, everything is golden and harmonious and exactly how it was meant to be. So that is Shopify 2. Oh my god. All right. Uh, all right, we made an embedded app SDK. Uh, so at one point, Shopify makes this API so that we can stop uh, telling our merchants no when they ask for complicated stuff, because we're like, go build it yourself, or hire somebody else to build it for you. Uh, eventually, that happens a lot, and we're like, maybe we should offer a place to market these apps. So a Shopify app is really just a website over here, a web application that happens to have permission to access a shop's API. That's it. So when you install an app, it's like, I'm going to give permission to this other web application. The downside is that, OK, right, so this is the back end of the Shopify admin. And uh, when I click on an app, I get this screen, uh, which is not like super intuitive. For a lot of our customer base who uh, weren't super like self-identifying technical people, they got really comp uh, confused by this. Like They got over it eventually, but they're like, where did Shopify go? Am I still in my store? Like, What's the deal? Where have I gone? So instead, we're like, it should be like this instead. Next. It should be like this instead. Um, so this is a for real working application. Uh, the app is just like <laughs> this part here. So there's uh, like a tiny iframe going on in here. But the beautiful thing about this is that it can interact with the rest of the Shopify API, or admin, rather. Yeah. Um, so it's an iframe, but it's using post message to communicate back and forth. Right. Uh, so it, like inside of this app, if you're like, can you pop up some stuff that looks like you're in the admin, uh, if you want to like show spinners, um, all these other things, modal style windows, this kind of stuff. So if you're not familiar with post message, it's a really cool, uh, fairly recent DOM API that allows you to communicate between different domains in different windows of the same app securely. So that's basically what we're using to let third party developers uh, run JavaScript within our storefronts. Right, so why are we telling you this? If you have a platform and you have an API, you want to do embedded apps, this is the pattern to go with. We've been playing with this for years and run into all sorts of crappy ways. This is the best way forward, and we've open sourced this as well. Uh, it's a brand new API, uh, but developers are already making like boatloads of money with it. If you'd like to play around with it, it's in uh, github.com slash Shopify slash embedded app example. Uh, there's one more thing we want to talk about with commerce. Uh, Edward, have you ever built anything that handles discounts? Oh, fancy you ask me, Nick. Why, yes, I have. It's uh, pretty complicated, isn't it? It is the worst. So like, let's say I want a discount engine that just gives you 20% off your order. Uh, OK, I can do that. It's okay. easy. But wait, but only orders over $100. OK, that's okay. not that bad. Wait, but it has to be $100 before you factor in shipping. All right. OK, but uh, you can't have any items that are on sale in your cart. I don't really know what you mean by like on sale. Cause, OK, like, that doesn't do that. matter. But you can only get a discount while the moon is in a specific cycle. You're like a Wiccan yes. shop? Yes, okay. exactly. Um, no offense to Wiccans. Okay. Uh, no, that's totally cool. So it uh, turns out it's like really hard to build these discount engines. And Yeah, I don't really want to do this. Like. No. Shopify does not let you do this. Uh, I don't think any e-commerce platform would let you do something like this. We wanted to fix that. So uh, we're working on this prototype, basically DSL. Uh, it's like a subset of JavaScript, and it lets merchants and developers build their own discount engines. Basically, you get a blob of uh, JSON of the order before any discounts were applied. And you do your like black magic. Exactly. It doesn't um, matter then, what wicked magic it is. And then you send back a. Uh, JSON blob of the order after discounts are applied. Right. And Shopify handles the rest. Yeah, so we're producing like prototypes that are working that are like little node sandboxes of things. Uh, we're still not there yet, but again, overarching theme here is sometimes your customers love good DSL, and you should give that to them instead of doing the work. Um, cool. Okay, All right. right. So, sorry, talk three. Uh, quickly want to go through what's new in Batman JS, Nick, Teeth. Edward, Tiger, Shopify. Uh, if you don't know what Batman is, uh, Batman is a JavaScript MVC framework that we built at Shopify with the express purpose of powering Shopify 2. It's similar to Angular or Ember, but where it differs is that it really tries to follow similar conventions to Rails. Does not mean it's Rails only, it's backend agnostic and will work with anything with an Ajax API. But if you are familiar with Rails, you can start building apps really easily. Uh, so the main new thing that we've released lately is the new site, which Sweet I'd like demo. to demo really quickly. 
Uh, right, this is one of the major complaints about Batman when we first released it, was there are no docs. Please make it easier for me to get started using Batman. So we built this. When you go to batmanjs.org now, there's a live tutorial right in the site. Ooh, ah. And it's a live code editor with all of the files that you need. It walks you through getting started building a Batman app. So if I add the Batman Rails gem, hit save. Uh, now I have some generators. I can build a new Batman app right in my web browser. Oh yeah, launch that app. Launch app. Uh, so this is actually a running Batman application, it's and it's based to be like on a all the code. The it's because I went to full screen mode. Oh, it's because you're in full screen. Yeah. There we go. All right. Uh, and now, if I make changes in this window, hey, JSConf, and hit save, then this window will automatically reflect with uh, automatically update with all of your changes. So you yeah. can actually build a full functioning Batman application in this little text editor. Um, and preview it over here. The tutorial walks you through building a whole audio playlist management application. Uh, the other big thing that we've been working on is docs. So one of the big complaints was that our docs were insufficient or out of date. So we spent a lot of time uh, investing in better documentation and rail style guides. And uh, a lot more of the framework is documented. It's still a work in progress, but we're like going to. You can to, use this now. Yeah, it's usable now. So hooray. Yay, docs. OK. Uh, just released a new version. It's got lots of cool stuff. New test suite coverage. Batman Rails is a Ruby gem, which is less applicable here at JSConf. But if you have a Rails application, it lets you immediately get started using Batman with your Rails API. Uh, and we're going to start pushing this as the best JavaScript framework for Rails developers. It was built for us at Shopify, which is a Rails application. And uh, if you are familiar with Rails, you're going to feel right at home. But you don't have to use it. It doesn't Rails. necessarily mean that you have to use Rails. like. It's supported on Node. Like you can really have any backend. Exactly. All right. So coming up, uh, more docs, clean up some more APIs, better performance. Shopify is already really fast, but we want to make it even faster. Nick, when's and the 1.0 coming? All this is going to lead to the 1.0 soon. Real soon now. All right. Danke. All right. Next talk. Uh, four. Do yeah, I four. Tell four. four. Yeah. Okay. Teeth. So yeah. Here's some teeth. I'm Nick. This is Edward. Hi. Uh, <laughs> we work at Shopify. So. Something I didn't realize uh, until a talk at JSConf US last, this past JSConf uh, by Ray Daly was JavaScript is becoming a tool used for storytelling and reporting. It's being used in the media. Uh, yeah, just today, uh, Astrid gave a great talk highlighting how JavaScript lets her tell more interactive stories. It does a better job of eliciting emotional responses because through interaction, the readers and like, the people who are getting into this story can actually reach out and touch things. They can get into it. So here's an example of uh, the New York Times' Snowfall article or story. I don't know what it's called now. So if but you haven't beautiful. seen this, it's a gorgeous article about uh, the avalanches yeah, in the Washington like Cascades. Videos and all sorts of interactive stuff. Pictures, infographics. Like It's really amazing. It gives you a lot more data and a lot more background about the story and what the reporter is trying to tell you. Uh, another example is. Oh, snap. Arcade Fire just released this new music video. Uh, yeah, if you haven't played with this yet, do it. It's amazing. I'm not going to do it on conference Wi-Fi, but basically, it uses WebGL and your camera, and yeah, you hold and your, your phone, phone up to your and camera. Your, like, are like shining light into parts of the screen. It's really cool. So it tells you a story. It's a music video. It's amazing. Try it out. It's really cool. Play. Oh, God. Play. Oh, we're going to die. Nope. Come back. OK, there we go. So Snowfall, uh, Arcade Fire. Um, this is really cool right. for a few reasons. Um, first, uh, that journalism has attained a new level of depth and a new method of delivery that wasn't possible before. But also, uh, it's an indication that JavaScript has become approachable enough that it's now being used by people who, w again, like, wouldn't self-identify as like, a technological person. So a really smart JavaScript programmer once told me um, that they don't actually like JavaScript or all of the compiled to JavaScript languages. Not saying I agree with this, but the reason why is because it's become too easy, and it's lowered the barrier to entry too much uh, that it's really easy to make really dumb mistakes or to spend too much of your time thinking about other stuff. Uh, but a takeaway that I got from that was it actually lowers the barrier to entry. 
uh, it lets, lets us push JavaScript and technology into places like journalism and commerce where technology would not normally be used. All right, thanks, Sean. Uh, Next, uh, talk quickly about some DSLs and APIs and why you should build them in JavaScript. So I'm Nick, Teeth, Edward, Tiger, Hi. Shopify. Uh, <laughs> DSLs make a lot of things more approachable right. and Again, targeted. A DSL is a domain-specific language. Uh, it takes into account what kinds of words and meanings and subject matter uh, someone would use in their own domain, like let's say that I'm a journalist or mm -hmm. I'm a storyteller. I'm going to use uh, something that kind of looks like a programming language, but it doesn't immediately make me think like, oh, I'm playing with JavaScript or whatever. Um, and so when you build a DSL, a new developer or somebody who's not even a developer doesn't have to learn, think about JavaScript and the browser and the DOM and the computer and all these different things. They only have to think about what your DSL is actually providing, like the business logic they want to build. Uh, a good rule of thumb is that you shouldn't have to write documentation for a DSL because a mm -hmm. new developer isn't going to know how to read documentation. Yeah, a good DSL is approachable. So what does a bad DSL look like? Uh, does anyone know what this guy is? Uh, this is regular, an, a regular expression for parsing a valid email address, and it's probably wrong. This isn't even it. Like, this goes on for like 50,000 more lines. Uh, so regex, it's... an approachable DSL, maybe to some. <laughs> probably not. Um, we can do better. Uh, so here's an example of an OK DSL. This is actually uh, from Batman, from the Shopify code base. Uh, I like this one, obviously, because I made it. But basically, it takes a lot of different complex functionality from Batman models and streamlines them into one consistent syntax. And um, this model really clearly like, explains its behavior. Uh, the common DSL throughout Batman is a class, an at symbol to say, hey, this class should have this behavior, and then which API function you want to call. OK, here is a good DSL. Uh, so our friend Daniel, the other guy in the tiger, tiger picture, picture. Um, he's been playing around with educational tools and products, and he made this DSL for uh, learning how to program. Where's my Chrome? Uh, take us there. There we go. Are we looking at the so, same thing? Yes, this okay, is yeah. RoboBattle. So, uh, except it's cut off. Really? Yeah. Uh, just don't full screen. OK, not full screen. Eight minutes. <laughs> it's not full screen. OK, it hates us. That's go. good. Drag that over. Perfect. OK, Kay, cool. The big takeaway here is that there is a robot. There are four functions in this DSL. Move down. Move right, move left, uh, whatever. You hit run, and the robot does it. It's stupid simple. It's designed to like get kids uh, calling functions and getting used to this idea. Um, it changes as you type it. So if you do this, he'll start right. moving up. There's no like compile or anything. You just like use this little baby DSL. It's not even really a DSL. Like, it's just four functions. But yeah. by streamlining all of it into these four functions, it's a lot easier for kids to actually see what's happening. Cool. DSLs. Uh, they expose, oh god. Basically, they don't have to be just for apps uh, or robots or discounts or Batman models. You can add a DSL to just about anything, right? Yeah. And suddenly, you expose another level of functionality to people who might not normally be able to add functionality to your product. And you don't have to do anything. You get this all for free. Uh, I implore you to think about adding some APIs or DSLs to your product, uh, just like we do with the Shopify API. All right, Donkey Shoes, next. Politics Chess. OK. So we work at Shopify. Edward does not have a tiger. Uh, I'm Nick. These are my teeth. And my teeth and I would one day like to run for public office. So let me tell you a quick story. My family got uh, our first computer when I was like six or seven years old. And I started uh, programming because I wanted to figure out how to hack these awesome DOS games. So I got some Visual Basic skills. Yeah, what? Dim everything. Dim everything. Uh, I kept pushing and learning with this magical thing called the internet. Eventually started doing some freelance. Uh, I got pretty into Cocoa and JavaScript and eventually this framework called Cappuccino. Uh, I then started university, pretty quickly figured out it was not for me. 
So I left, went back to web development, and got some pretty sweet jobs, get to go to some awesome conferences like this one, and hang out with all you wonderful, smart people. My story is not that special. It probably sounds familiar to a lot of you. Uh, as far as that story goes and programming goes, I'm not the, wor the best, I'm not the worst. So isn't that a perfect qualification for running for public office? Uh, it's something I'd like to do at some point. We could talk about reasons why later or offline. Uh, but what it means is that I spend a lot of time thinking about politics and technology and how they can work together. Normally that evokes images of like bullshit e-government and stuff like that, but it doesn't have to. Thinking back to the earlier thing about how JavaScript lowers the barrier to entry, we can apply it not just to storytelling and e-commerce, but to politics as well. So one thing we could do is, for example, uh, start hosting our legal code on GitHub or some GitHub-like service. Imagine being able to access uh, all of your laws in a format, uh, in all of the formats that GitHub provides, being able to go back through the commit history, mm -hmm. see who changed what and when. Actually, right now, like today, there is a legal hack fest uh, showing off this new API that the Canadian Association of Lawyers have put together. So we're like, hey, we need to catch up and offer APIs and DSLs to our own legal code. So like, that's being hacked on today. These are not just like pie in the sky ideas. This stuff is coming. So this has actually kind of already been done. Uh, United States is a, I think, somewhat parody GitHub account. Uh, but one of the things he did is wrote a scraper uh, that scrapes the US legal code and periodically updates changes to GitHub. So you can kind of go get the US code from GitHub. It's just not official. Uh, another one, uh, I recently had to go renew my health card for Ontario. And it took no less than three different trips to City Hall to actually get the card. Uh, this guy named Dominic Haman uh, had a really similar experience with Germany's so-called e-government. You can read this article. It's pretty interesting. Basically, he got access but couldn't do anything with it. Right. The kicker is like none of these things, none of these forms are so complex or so private that uh, you have to go through 20 different people or 20 different uh, provincial employees. So if we just had a simple system of online identity, which we don't yet, but cool people are working on it. Hey, Persona. Yeah. Uh, Woo. There's no reason that like at least half of all the bureaucracy we, do, we as citizens deal with all the time couldn't be moved online. All right, uh, basically just keep pushing, like keep building cool stuff and uh, like build DSLs. Uh, like Chrissy was talking about yesterday with persona UX testing, maybe name one of your personas after a politician and think, hey, could this politician use this application? Uh, and if we keep pushing and we all keep doing this, then we can eventually get to like a better more better place. Government, technology, harmony. And that's something yeah. that I'm interested like, in. That'd be pretty rad. All right, last talk. Uh, oh, shit, okay. The sun never sets on the JavaScript empire. The JavaScript empire is growing. Yes, it's now available in like hardware forms. We're seeing it in flying robots. Hey. <laughs> um, uh, it's like, I don't know if you know this, but like you can embed JavaScript inside of a PDF, and it will render properly. You can also use JavaScript to make a PDF. Uh, it's being used in operating systems. It's being used in to phones. To create operating systems. Yeah, there's another operating system called oh, like JSOS, where it's just a whole OS written in JavaScript. Uh, but it's also being sneaky, and not just being used in different technologies, but different uh, areas where technology would not normally be used or where JavaScript would not normally be used. So I don't know if you saw this, but the new SimCity, terrible Disastrous launch. launch terrible. Uh, fraught with DRM issues, but whatever. Uses JavaScript to do a lot of its own like internal UI yeah. and a lot of the rules engines and this all the stuff. We used it uh, to help educate our students more better. Uh, different newspapers are using JavaScript to make their articles more interactive and add more depth. Yeah, uh, we're letting API developers do a better job and let customers do our work for us. And like more and more politics and government and technology is being merged together and moving online. Uh, it's JavaScript and technology are being used in hospitals, in iPads, in medicine, in university ad admission processes. Basically, JavaScript is growing. We've become a massive empire, and we can say that the sun will never set on the JavaScript empire. We agree with what Brendan said last night, that it's going to keep growing and be the language that you write yourself and going to keep growing and be a low-level language. And it very well might end up being a foundation for a lot of modern civilization. 
uh, we're, we're all citizens of the JavaScript empire, and we implore you to help it grow as well. I'm going to keep pushing it in technology or in politics and government. Yep, I'm going to keep pushing for JavaScript to go into education and open data. So maybe instead of building that to-do app, uh, build something that lets somebody else solve their own problem. Build apps that solve problems outside of our industry. Get uh, outside the bubble. Glory to the JavaScript empire. and <laughs> Glory to the uh, apps if he gets. Glory to the JavaScript empire. Glory to us all. Huzzah. Hey, we're done! Yeah.